at five o'clock, it took her twenty minutes to get home. Once the small town was behind her, the road narrowed and she passed fields and trees and fences, odd mailboxes and empty vacation homes. It was dark when she parked in her driveway. Harry Dean was preening on the porch. Her mother sat in a rocking chair, smoking, listening, or rather not listening, to the radio. Elizabeth limped toward the house, careful not to trip on the uneven ground. Her mother didn't look at her. She scratched the peacock's blue head, and he clucked. Her mother was out in space somewhere. Mom, Elizabeth said. Her mother stirred, took a drag, then made eye contact. Oh, she hummed. How is work, honey? Good. Elizabeth sat down in the hammock next to her mother and knew with dismay she would need help getting up. They sat silently for a long time, watching the night darken. They never did have much to say to each other. Only once had Elizabeth opened her soul to her mother. Only once had she told her the secret, but that had been enough to heal a natural rift between them, and now they lived in peace. It was a warm night for late winter. Elizabeth inhaled. She smelled the musk of American spirits, the delicate odors of the trees and the grass breathing, the sweet dampness of the water nearby. The radio played a news report. It was always the news, never music. She saw her mother's trembling hand twirling the cigarette between thumb and forefinger. When her mother inhaled, Elizabeth heard a tiny, uncharacteristic catch in her breath. Is something wrong, Mom? No, she exhaled, and Elizabeth saw that this was a lie. She rubbed her lame pinky, which had begun to hurt, and considered what to say next. Something has happened, though, hasn't it? Her mother was quiet for a long time. Somebody called for you today. There was a quiver in the voice. Erzabet frowned. A call? This was strange indeed. There was a reason she didn't have a cell phone. Who? Her mother sucked on the filter of her cigarette. They left a message. Erzabet felt her pinky cramping. She gritted her teeth and realized that she would not get any help out of the hammock. This was a new darkness in her mother, and yet not so new. It reminded her of a life they had once lived, a life from which neither had completely recovered. She swung back and forth on the hammock until the force propelled her to her feet, and she limped into the house, leaning on her cane. It was pitch inside. Her mother never left any lights on. She rubbed some cream on her hands and made a round through the house, dispelling the gloom. There were three messages on the answering machine before the one meant for her. Both she and her mother always let incoming calls go to the machine before answering. The first was a message from the pharmacy letting her mother know a prescription was ready. The second was from her aunt, Sophia. I know you're there, Betty, the disembodied voice said. I went to visit Laszlo yesterday, and there are weeds growing all over that headstone. I know you were having trouble getting out there, but you agreed to do this, Betty. Elizabeth tuned out her aunt's voice and scrolled through caller ID. A shard of ice pierced her heart when she saw the most recent number. She paused the answering machine and stared at the number, or rather, the area code. It was unusual, not local. And yet she recognized it. And then the fear and a twitch in her fingers. 707. Far away, far north on the coast at the opposite end of the state was a town, the Crescent City. She thought of its name and shuddered, thought of fog and mists, the persistent hypnotic sloshing of the waves, of ancient forests filled with secrets. She had been there once a long time ago. She pressed play.